The order was given to make a bridge of very strong beams and planks that we could carry it with us and place it where the bridges were broken. 400 Tlaxcalan Indians and 150 soldiers were told off to carry this bridge and place it in position and guard the passage until the army and all the baggage crossed. 200 Tlaxcalan Indians and 50 soldiers were told off to carry the cannon and Gonzalo de Sandoval, Diego de Alda, Francisco de Salcedo, Francisco de Lugo, and a company of 100 young and active soldiers were selected to go in the van to do the fighting. It was agreed that Cortez himself, Alonso de la Villa, Cristobal de Olid, and other captains should go in the middle and support the party that most needed help in fighting. Pedro de Alvarado and Juan Velasquez de Leon were with the rear guard and placed in the middle between them and the preceding section were two captains and the soldiers of Narve and two, three hundred flash cannons, and thirty soldiers were told off to take charge of the prisoners and of Doña Marina and Doña Luisa. And by the time this arrangement was made, it was already night. In order to bring out the gold and divide it up and carry it, Cortez ordered his steward named Cristobal de Guzman and other soldiers who were his servants to bring out all the gold and jewels and silver, and he gave them many flash Indians for the purpose, and they placed it in the hall, then Cortez told the king's officers named Alonso d'Alvila and Gonzalo Mejia to take charge of the gold belonging to his majesty, and he gave them seven wounded and lame horses and one mare and many friendly Tlaxcalans, more than eighty in number, and they loaded them with parcels of it, as much as they could carry, for it was put up into very broad ingots, and much gold still remained in the hall piled up in heaps. Then Cortez called his secretary and the others who were king's notaries and said, Bear witness for me that I can do no more with this gold. We have here in this apartment and hall over 700,000 pesos in gold, and as you have seen, it cannot be weighed nor placed in safety. I now give it up to any of the soldiers who care to take it, otherwise it will be lost among those dogs and maggots. When they heard this, many of the soldiers of Narve and some of our people loaded themselves with it, I declared that I had no other desire but the desire to save my life, but I did not fail to carry off from some small boxes that were there four chalchuites, which are stones very highly prized among the Indians, and I quickly placed them in my bosom under my armor, and later on the price of them served me well in healing my wounds and getting me food. After we had learnt the plans that Cortez had made about the way in which we would to escape that night and get to the bridges, as it was somewhat dark and cloudy and rainy, we began before midnight to bring along the baggage, and the horses and mare began their march, and the flash columns who were laden with gold. Then the bridge was quickly put in place, and Cortez and the others whom he took with him in the first detachment, and many of the horsemen crossed over it. While this was happening, the voices, trumpets, cries, and whistles of the Mexicans began to sound, and they called out in their language to the people of Tlantle local, Come out at once with your canoes, for the tools are leaving. Cut them off, so that not one of them may be left alive. When I least expected it, we saw so many squadrons of warriors bearing down on us, and the lake so crowded with canoes that we could not defend ourselves. Many of our soldiers had already crossed the bridge, and while we were in this position, a great multitude of Mexicans charged down on us with the intention of removing the bridge and wounding and killing our men, who were unable to assist each other. And as fortune is perverse at such times, one mischance followed another. As it was raining, two of the horses slipped and fell into the lake. When I and the others of Cortez's company saw that, we got safely to the other side of the bridge, and so many warriors charged on us that despite all our good fighting, no further use could be made of the bridge, so that the passage of water opening was soon filled up with dead horses, Indian men and women, servants, baggage, and boxes. Fearing that they would not fail to kill us, we thrust ourselves ahead along the causeway, and we met many squadrons armed with long lances waiting for us, and they used abusive words to us, and among them they cried, O oh, villains, are you still alive? And with the cuts and thrusts we give them, we got through, and although they then wounded six of those who were going along with me. Then, if there was some sort of plan such as we had agreed upon, it was an accursed one, for Cortez and the captains and soldiers who passed first on horseback so as to save themselves and reach dry land and make sure of their lives spurred on along the causeway, and they did not fail to attain their object, 
and the horses with the gold and the flesh talons also got out in safety. I assert that if we had waited, the horsemen and the soldiers, one for the other, at the bridges, we should all have been put an end to, and not one of us would have been left alive. The reason was this, that as we went along the causeway, charting the Mexican squadrons, on one side of us was water, and on the other, Azateas, and the lake was full of canoes, so that we could do nothing. Moreover, the muskets and crossbows were all left behind at the bridge, and as it was night time, what could we do beyond what we accomplished, which was to charge and give some sword thrust to those who tried to lay hands on us, and to march and get on ahead so as to get off the causeway. Had it been the daytime, it would have been far worse, and we who escaped did so only by the grace of God. To one who saw the hosts of warriors who fell on us that night, and the canoes full of them coming along to carry off our soldiers, it was terrifying. So we went around along the causeway in order to get to the town of Tacuba, where Cortez was already stationed with all the captains. Gonzalo de Sandoval, Cristobal de Olid, and others of those horsemen who had gone on ahead were crying out, Senor Captain, let us halt, where they say that we are fleeing and leaving them to die at the bridges. Let us go back and help them, if any of them survive. But not one of them came out or escaped. Cortez's reply was that it was a miracle that any of us escaped. However, he promptly went back with the horsemen and the soldiers who were unwounded. But they did not march far, for Pedro de Alvarado soon met them, badly wounded, holding a spear in his hand, and on foot, for the enemy had already killed his sorrel mare and he brought with him four soldiers as badly wounded as he was himself, and eight Clash Collins, all of them with blood flowing from many wounds. While Cortez was on the causeway with the rest of the captains, we repaired to the courtyard in Tacuba. Many squadrons had already arrived from Mexico, shouting out orders to Tacuba, and to the other town named Azcapotzalco, and began to hurl darts, stones, and arrows, and attack with their long lances. We made some charges, and both men attacked and defended themselves. Let us go back to Pedro de Alvarado. When Cortez and the other captains met him in that way, and saw that no more soldiers were coming along the causeway, tears sprang to his eyes. Pedro de Alvarado said that Juan Velasquez de Leon lay dead, with many other gentlemen, both of our own company and that of Narve, and that more than eighty of them were at the bridge, that he and the four soldiers whom he brought with him after their horses had been killed, crossed the bridge in great peril over the dead bodies, horses, and boxes with which that passage at the bridge was choked. Moreover, he said that all the bridges and causeways were crowded with warriors. At the Bridge of Sorrow, which they afterwards called Alvarado's Leap, I assert that at the time not a single soldier stopped to see if he leaped much or little, for we could hardly save our own lives, as we were in great danger of death on account of the multitude of Mexicans charging down on us. I never heard of this leap of Alvarado until after Mexico was captured, and it was in some satirical verses made by a certain Gonzalo de Ocampo, which, as they were somewhat nasty, I will not fully quote here, except that he says, Thou shouldst remember the leap that thou tookst from the bridge, but I will not dwell on this subject. Let us go on, and I will relate how, when we were waiting in Tacuba, Many Mexican warriors came together from all of those towns, and they killed three of our soldiers, so we agreed to get out of that town as quickly as we could, and five Tlaxcalan Indians, who found out a way towards Tlaxcala without following the main road, guided us with great precaution until we reached some small houses placed on a hill, and near to them a queue or oratory built like a fort where we halted. As we marched along, we were followed by the Mexicans, who hurled arrows and darts at us, and stones from their slings, and the way in which they surrounded us and continually attacked us was terrifying, as I have already said many times, and am tired of repeating. We defended ourselves in that queue and fortress where we lodged and attended to the wounded, and made many fires, but as for anything to eat, there was no thought of it. At that cure oratory, after the great city of Mexico was captured, we built a church, which is called Nuestra Señora de los Remedios, and is very much visited, and many of the inhabitants and ladies from Mexico now go there on pilgrimages and to hold novenas. It was pitiable to see our wounds being dressed and bound up with cotton cloths, and as they were chilled and swollen, they were very painful. However, what was more to be wept over was the loss of the gentlemen and brave soldiers who were missing, namely, 
Juan Velasquez de Leon, Francisco de Sosedo, Francisco de Morla, Lares the Good Horseman, and many others of us followers of Cortez. I name these few only because it would be a long business to write the names of the great number of our companions who were missing. Of the followers of Narve, the greater number were left at the bridges, weighed down with gold. Let us go on to say how they were left dead at the bridges, the sons and daughters of Montezuma, as well as the prisoners we were bringing with us, also Kakemashin, the lord of Texcoco, and other kings of provinces. Let us stop relating all these hardships and say how we were thinking of what we had in front of us, for we were all wounded and only twenty-three horses escaped. Then of the cannon, artillery, and powder we saved nothing. The crossbows were few in number, and we promptly mended their cords and made arrows, but the worst of all was that we did not know what we should find the disposition of our friends, the Tlashkalans would be towards us. In addition to this, always surrounded by Mexicans, who fell on us with yells, we determined to get out of that place at midnight with the Tlashkalans in front as guides, taking every precaution. We marched with the wounded in the middle and the lame supported with staves, and some, who were very bad and could not walk, on the croups of the horses that were lame and were not fit for fighting. Those horsemen who were not wounded went in front, or were divided some on one side, some on the other, and marching in this manner all of us who were most free from wounds kept our faces towards the enemy. The wounded clash Callans went in the body of our squadron, and the rest of them who were sufficiently sound faced the enemy in company in front of us. The Mexicans were always harassing us with loud cries, yells, and whistles, shouting out, you are going where not one of you will be left alive. And we did not understand why they said so, but it will be seen later on. But I have forgotten to write down how happy we were to see Doña Marina still alive, and Doña Luisa, the daughter of Jicotenga, whose escape at the bridges was due to some Clash Collins, and also a woman named Maria de Estrada, who was the only Spanish woman in Mexico. Those who escaped and got away first from the bridges were some sons of Jicotenga, the brothers of Doña Luisa. Most of our servants who had been given to us in Tlaxcala and in the city of Mexico itself were left behind, dead. That day we reached some farms and huts belonging to a large town named Cautitlan. Thence we went through some farms and hamlets with the Mexicans always in pursuit of us and as many of them had got together, they endeavored to kill us and began to surround us and hurled many stones with their slings and javelins and arrows and with their broadswords they killed two of our soldiers in a bad pass and they also killed a horse and wounded many of our men and we also with cut and thrust killed some of them and the horsemen did the same. We slept in those houses and we ate the horse they had killed and the next day very early in the morning we began our march with the same and even greater precautions than we had observed before half of the horsemen always going ahead, on a plain a little more than a league further on, when we began to think that we could march in safety, our scouts, who were on the lookout, returned to say that the fields were full of Mexican warriors waiting for us. When we heard this, we were indeed alarmed, but not so as to be faint-hearted or to fail to meet them and fight to the death. There we halted for a short time, and orders were given how the horsemen were to charge and return at a hand gallop and were not to stop to spear the enemy, but to keep their lances aimed at their faces until they broke up their squadrons, and that all the soldiers and the thrust they gave should pass their swords through the bodies of their opponents, and that we should act in such a way as to avenge thoroughly the deaths and wounds of our companions, so that if God willed it, we should escape with our lives. After commending ourselves to God and the Holy Mary, full of courage and calling on the name of Signor Santiago, as soon as we saw that the enemy began to surround us, and that the horsemen, keeping in parties of five, broke through their ranks, we all of us charged at the same time. Oh, what a sight it was to see this fearful and destructive battle, how we moved all mixed up with them, foot to foot, and the cuts and thrusts we gave them, and with what fury the dogs fought, and what wounds and deaths they inflicted on us with their lances and macanas. Then, as the ground was level, to see how the horsemen speared them as they chose, charging and returning, and although both they and their horses were wounded, they never stopped fighting like very brave men, 
As for all of us who had no horses, it seemed as if we all put on double strength, for although we were wounded and again received further wounds, we did not trouble to bind them up so as to not halt to do so, for there was not time, but with great spirit we closed with the enemy so as to give them sword thrusts. I wish to tell about Cortez, and Cristobal de Olid, Gonzalo de Sandoval, Gonzalo Dominguez, and a Juan de Salamanca, who, although badly wounded, rode on one side and the other, breaking through the squadrons, and about the words that Cortez said to those who were in the thick of the enemy, that the cuts and thrusts that we should be aimed at distinguished chieftains, for they all of them bore great golden plumes and rich arms and devices. Then to see how the valiant and spirited Sandoval encouraged us, he cried, now, gentlemen, this is the day when we are bound to be victorious. Have trust in God, and we shall come out of this alive for some good purpose. They killed and wounded a great many number of our soldiers, but it pleased God that Cortez and the captains whom I have already named, who went in this company, reached the place where the captain general of the Mexicans was marching with his banner displayed, and with rich golden armor and great gold and silver plumes. When Cortez saw him with many other Mexican chieftains all wearing great plumes, he said to our captains, Now, senores, let us break through them. Leave none of them unwounded. And commending themselves to God, Cortez, Cristobal de Olid, Sandalo, Alonso de la Vila, and the other horsemen charged. And Cortez struck his horse against the Mexican captain, which made him drop his banner and the rest of our captain succeeded in breaking through the squadron, which consisted of many Indians following the captain who carried the banner, who nevertheless had not fallen at the shock that Cortez had given him. And it was Juan de Salamanca who rode with Cortez on a good piebald mare, who gave him a lance thrust and took from him the rich plume that he wore, and afterwards gave it to Cortez, saying that as it was he who first met him and made him lower his banner and deprived his followers of the courage to fight, that the plume belonged to him, Cortez. However, three years afterwards, the king gave it to Salamanca as his coat of arms, and his descendants bear it on their tabards. Let us go back to the battle. It pleased our lord that when that captain who carried the Mexican banner was dead, and many others were killed there, their attack slackened, and all the horsemen followed them, and we felt neither hunger nor thirst, and it seemed as though we had neither suffered nor passed through any evil or hardship, as we followed up our victory killing and wounded. Then our friends, the Tlaxcalans, were very lion-like, and with their swords and broadswords, which they were capturing from the enemy, they behaved very well and valiantly. When the horsemen returned from following up the victory, we all gave many thanks to God for having escaped from such a great multitude of people, for there had never been seen or found throughout the Indies such a great number of warriors together in any battle that was fought, for there was present there the flower of Mexico and Texcoco, and all the towns around the lake, and others in the neighborhood, and the people of Otumba, and Tepet Texcoco, and Saltocan, who came in the belief that this time not a trace of us would be left. Then what rich armor they wore, with so much gold and plumes and devices, and nearly all of them were captains and chieftains, near the spot where this hard-fought and celebrated battle took place, and where one can say God spared our lives, there stands a town named Otumba. Our escape from the city of Mexico was on the 10th of the month of July, 1520, and this celebrated battle of Otumba was fought on the 14th of July. I assert that within a matter of five days, over 860 soldiers were killed and sacrificed, as well as 72 who were killed in a town named Tustepec, together with five Spanish women. Those who were killed at Tustepec belonged to the Company of Narve, and over a thousand Tlaxcalans were slain. At that time, they also killed one de Alcantara the Elder, with three other settlers from Villarica. If many more of the followers of Narve than those of Cortes died at the bridges, it was because they went forth laden with gold, and owing to its weight, they could neither escape nor swim. We went on to some other farms, and a small town where there was a good queue and a strong house, where we defended ourselves that night and dressed our wounds and got some rest. Although squadrons of Mexicans still followed us, they did not dare to come up to us, and those who did come were as though they said, There you go, out of our country. From that small town where we slept, the hills against Tlaxcala could be seen, 
and when we saw them we were as delighted as though they had been our own homes. But how could we know for certain that they were loyal to us, or what settled at Villarica, whether they were alive or dead? Cortez said to us that, although we were few in number, and there were only four hundred and forty of us left, with twenty horses and twelve crossbowmen and seven musketeers, and we had no powder and were all wounded, lame and maimed, we could see very clearly how Lord Jesus Christ had been pleased to spare our lives. And for that we should always give him great thanks and honor. Moreover, we had come again to be reduced to the number and strength of the soldiers who accompanied them the first time we entered Mexico, namely four hundred soldiers. He begged us not to give annoyance to the people in Tlaxcala, and not to take anything from them. And this he explained to the followers of Narve, for they were not used to obey their captains of the wars as we were. Moreover, he said, he trusted in God that we should find the Tlaxcalans true and very loyal, and that if it were otherwise, which God forfend, we must turn aside the blows of fate with stout hearts and strong arms. And for this, we must be well prepared. With our scouts ahead of us, we reached a spring on the hillside where there were some walls and defenses made in past times, and our friends the Tlaxcalans said that this was the boundary between them and the Mexicans, and in welcome tranquility, after the misery we had gone through, we halted to wash and to eat. Then we soon resumed our march and went to a Tlaxcalan town named Weyotlapan, where they received us and gave us to eat, but not much, unless we paid them with some small pieces of gold and chalchuites, which some of us carried with us, and they gave us nothing without payment. There we remained one day resting and curing our wounds, and we also attended to the horses. Then, as soon as they heard the news at the capital of Tlaxcala, Mazi Ascazi and Jicotenga the Elder, and Chichimecatecle, and many other caciques and chieftains, and nearly all the inhabitants of Huechotzingo promptly came to us. When they reached the town where we were camped, they came to embrace Cortez and all of his captains and soldiers, and some of them weeping, especially Mazi Ascazi, Zicotenga, and Chichimecatecla, and Tapaneca. And they said to Cortez, Oh, Malinche, Malinche, how grieved we are at your fortunes and those of all your brothers and at the number of our own people who have been killed with yours. We have told you many times not to put trust in the Mexican people for one day or the other. They were sure to attack you, but you would not believe us. Now it has come to pass, and no more can be done at present than to tend you and give you to eat. Rest yourselves, for you are at home, and we will soon go to our town where we will find you quarters. Do not think, Malinche, that it is a small thing you have done to escape with your lives from that impregnable city and its bridges, and I tell you that if we formerly looked upon you as a very brave man, we now think you much more valiant. And although many Indian women in our towns would avail the deaths of their sons, husbands, brothers, and kinsmen, do not trouble yourself about that. Much do you owe to your gods who have brought you here and delivered you from such a multitude of warriors who were awaiting you at Otumba. For some days I had known that they were waiting for you to slay you. I wanted to go in search of you with 30,000 of our own warriors, but I could not start because they were not assembled, and many men were out collecting them. Cortez and all our captains and soldiers embraced them and told them that we all thanked them, and Cortez gave to all the chieftains golden jewels and precious stones, and as every soldier had escaped with as much as he could carry, some of us gave presents to our acquaintances from what we possessed. Then, what rejoicing and happiness they showed when they saw that Doña Luisa and Doña Marina were saved, and what weeping and sorrow for the other Indians who did not come but were left behind dead. Especially did Mazi Ascazi weep for his daughter Doña Elvira and the death of Juan Velázquez de León, to whom he had given her. In this way we went to the capital of Tlaxcala with all the caciques, and Cortes lodged in the houses of Mazi Ascazi and Gigotenga, 
gave his quarters to Pedro de Alvarado, and there we tended our wounds and began to recover our strength. But nevertheless, four soldiers died of their wounds, and some other soldiers failed to recover. We were also uneasy at not knowing about the people at Villarica, lest some disaster had happened to them. So Cortez at once wrote to them and sent a letter by three Tlaxcalans, and he asked them whether they had any powder or crossbows, because he wished to return and scour the neighborhood of Mexico. He also wrote to the officer named Caballero, whom he had left there as captain of the sea, and to keep watch that neither Narve nor any of the ships should leave for Cuba, and if he considered the two ships belonging to Narve, which were in the harbor, to be unfit for sea, that he should destroy them and send their crews to him with all the arms they possessed. Caballero wrote, and said he would soon dispatch the succor that they were sending from Villarica, numbering seven in all, including four sailors. Their captain was a soldier named Lencero. As they had arrived at Tlaxcala thin and ill, we often, for our own diversion, and to make fun of them, spoke of Lencero's help. For of the seven that came, five had liver complaint and were covered with boils, and the other two were swelled out with great bellies. I will tell what happened to us there in Tlaxcala with Jicotenga the Younger and his ill will. The truth is that when it became known in that city that they were fleeing from Mexico, and that the Mexicans had killed a great number of soldiers, and that we were coming for aid and shelter to Tlaxcala, Jicotenga the Younger went about appealing to all his friends and relations, and to others who he thought were on his side, and said to them that they should kill us and make friends with Cuitlahuac, the lord of Mexico and that, in addition to this, they should rob us of the cloaks and cloths which we had left, and the gold that we were now bringing from Mexico, and that they would all become rich with the spoil. This came to the ears of the elder Jicotenga, the father, who quarreled with him and told him that no such thought should have entered his head, that it was disgraceful, but much as his father rebuked him, he paid no heed, nor did it stop him from talking about and working at his evil purpose. This reached the ears of Chichimecatecla, who was the mortal enemy of Jicotega the Younger, and he told it to Mazayascasi, and they called together Jicotega the Elder and the chiefs of the Huetzotzingo, and ordered Jicotega the Younger to be brought prisoner before them. Then Mazayascasi made a speech to them all, and asked if they could remember, or heard it said, that during the last hundred years there had ever been throughout Tlaxcala such prosperity and riches as there had been since the Tuvs had arrived in their country, or if in any of their provinces they had ever seen so well provided for. For they possessed much cotton cloth and good and gold, and they ate salt, and that whatever the Tlaxcalans went with the tools, honor was paid to them out of respect to the Tuvs. And although many of them had now been killed in Mexico, they should bear in mind what their ancestors had said to them many years ago, that from where the sun rises, there would come men who would rule over them. Why then was Jicotenga now going about with these treasons and infamies, scheming to make war on us and kill us? It was evilly done. And there was no excuse to be made for it, for the knavery and mischief which he had always had hidden in his breast and now at the very moment when he saw us coming back defeated, when we ought to help us recover ourselves so as to turn again upon his enemies, the towns of Mexico, he wished to carry out his treachery. To these words, Zicotenga the Younger replied that what he had said about making peace with the Mexicans was a very wise decision, and he said other things that they could not tolerate. Then Maziascazi and Chichi Mecatecle and the old man, his father, blind as he was, arose and took Jicotega the younger by his collar and by his mantle and tore it and roughly pushing him and with reproachful words they cast him down the steps with his mantle all torn and had it not been for his father they would have slain him. The others who had been in his confidence were made prisoners. As we were all taking refuge there, it was not the time to punish him, and Cortez said nothing more about it. I have called this to mind so that it may be seen how loyal and good were these people of Tlaxcala, and how much we are indebted to them, and especially to good Jicotenga the Elder, who is said to have ordered his son to be killed, 
when he knew of his plots and treason. Let us leave this, and I will relate how we remained twenty-two days in that town, curing our wounds and recovering. Then Cortez determined that we should go to the province of Trepiaca, which was nearby. When Cortez told this to our captains, and they were preparing the soldiers of Narvaez to go to the war, as these men were not accustomed to fighting, and having escaped from the feet to Mexico and at the bridges, said little from the Battle of Otuma, they were most anxious to return to the island of Cuba, to their Indians and their gold. They cursed Cortez and his conquests. Especially was this the case with André de Duero, the partner of Cortez. When they saw that words had no effect on Cortez, they drew up a formal requisition before a king's notary, demanding that he should go at once to Villarica and abandon the war, giving us a reason that we had neither horses nor muskets, crossbows nor powder, nor thread with which to make crossbow strings, nor stores, that we were all wounded, and out of all our company and the soldiers of Narve, there only survived four hundred and forty and that the Mexicans would hold the strongholds, Sierras, and passes against us, and that if we delayed any longer, the ships would be eaten by worms, and many other things were stated in this petition. After Cortez had given his answer to the requisition, the men who were pressing their demands upon him saw that many of us who stood firmly by Cortez would put a stop to the importunity with which they expressed their demands, merely by insisting that it would be neither to the service of God nor His Majesty to desert their captain during wartime. And at the end of much discussion, they gave their obedience so far as to give us any expeditions that might be undertaken. But it was on condition that Cortez promised that when an opportunity should raise, he would allow them to return to the island of Cuba. The end of chapter 7